action. Good afternoon. Welcome to the 15th edition of On the Menu. I'm Bob Patillo. It is July the 9th, 2020, and my special guest today is Mr. Bob Flott. Bob, how are you? I'm doing fine, Bob Patillo. How are you doing? Well, I'm doing great. I was just telling Michelle at the chamber earlier that the first time I met you was I was in jail. Oh, and that was part of jail bail for the American Heart Association. That's right. Yep. I was in the jail at the mall waiting for somebody to come and bail me out for charity. And I did not. <laughs> you came up and stuck a microphone between the bars and started interviewing me, and I had no idea who you were, but I do now. Okay. I, Bob, that was uh, several years ago, wasn't it? 31 years ago. 31 years ago. Yes, so. it is. Been a great 31 years as well. Yes, it has. Sure has. Bob, I'd like to start off. Uh, tell us a little bit about where you're from and your family and, and eventually how you got to Alamogordo. All right, we can do that, Bob. Um, I come from a, I came from a family of a farmers in Flat Rock, Michigan, where my Mother and father and aunts and uncles and grandpas all lived on West Road there in Flat Rock, Michigan. They all had their individual small farms. On our farms, we raised about everything we could. We were self-sustaining. We raised a three to four acre a garden every year. My mom and dad ended up with seven boys and three girls. You know why we had a big garden. Along with that, we had pigs, chickens, ducks, geese. My dad used guinea hens for watchdogs because they make a lot of noise when people come around. We, we had the milk cows, 10 milk cows. We milked the cows at 5.30 a.m. and 5.30 p.m. Back then it was by hand, no milk machines, automatic milk machines. So, so we learned early on in our life, being a, a young boy on a farm in Michigan, that it takes a commitment when you're a farmer it takes you a, a commitment when you're a broadcaster. It takes a commitment, no matter what your career is, to work hard and be successful. And we um, moved out of Michigan in 1969. Yep, 1969, moved to Casper, Wyoming. Spent a couple of years there in Casper working with K2 Radio and Television in the marketing department left Casper and joined a gentleman by the name of Will Sims, a broadcaster. He had stations up in Wyoming and uh, was buying a new one in Laramie where the University of Wyoming is. And uh, he asked me to join his team in the marketing department. And I did, joined his team there and we had seven years there. And then we uh, left Wyoming in 1977. I guess the winter of 76 was one of those real cold winters in Laramie. Laramie sets it just over 7,000 feet, and it snows a lot in Laramie. It, it, the wind is terrific in Laramie. And I told my wife back then, you know, before the next flake flies, we're going to be out someplace where it's a little bit warmer. So Bill and I went on a little sojourn. We heard about Wayne Phelps radio station here being for sale. Back then it was called KALG. We came into town, spent a few days visiting with Wayne, looking at the potential for buying that station and ended up a few months later selling our properties up in Laramie and moving down here to Alamogordo. And that was that move was finalized in uh, mid-August of 1977 so we could get our kids in school on time. And we, go ahead. Go ahead and finish up. Okay, and, and, and of course, uh, We've had a great time here, Bob, uh, serving the uh, Alamogordo, Hallam Air Force Base area communities. We just completed a live interview with, uh, with the uh, four-star general, General David Goldfein, who was commander back here in 2006 and seven. And um, he's in town, as you know now, uh, through tomorrow, early tomorrow, he'll be leaving. But part of our community commitment all of those years has been doing that kind of work. And we learned that you had to make a commitment in life if you wanted to be something. And we learned also at that time that you don't get paid all the time, Bob, for everything you do. You know that, we know that. I think any business person learns that. And we learned that early in our life on the farm in Flat Rock, Flat Rock Michigan, 
when we lived on a dirt road, we were one of the big farms along there. And my dad had a John Deere Model B. And in the spring thaw, people would get stuck on that road. My dad would let us take his John Deere Model B down the road, pull that neighbor out, no matter where that neighbor lived. He was a neighbor to us. We'd pull him out. My dad said, boys, you don't take any money for this. And we learned by living in this world, you need to give to make the world better. And then a little bit later on after that, one of our neighbor farmers a couple of miles away was uh, baling hay. And he, um, his hay baler stuck. And he jumped off his tractor, not disengaging his hay baler, reached down in there to pull the hay out of the balers to free it up. And you know what happened. The baler activated, caught his arm in the baler and pretty well destroyed it. And so my dad got with us boys because we worked hard and said, boys, we've got some bailing to do for a friend. So that was our job for the next couple of weeks or so, helping out that farmer bail his hay to get it off the field to get his next, next crop ready. So I learned early on, like a lot of us have, that you just can't always have your hand out to be paid for everything you do. To make the world a better place, to make your community a better place, to make your life a better place, we have to give to help somebody else out. And we learned that, and it was a good, it was a good learning lesson for me. And I carry that forward today, Bob. So, Bob, what I've noticed you're telling me is that you've had what I consider to be a very successful life. I know you've been in business for a long time, but you did not come from a family of wealth. Uh, no, not at all. Our wealth was in the farm we owned. It saved a lot of money. My dad worked. My mom was not a uh, worker. She stayed home taking care of the kids. And, uh, you know, the, the money was tight, I know, but yet we were well provided for. Way back then, Bob, uh, before you were born, uh, my mom and dad on a Saturday would go to the feed store in Flat Rock, Michigan, and we had to buy some of the food for our chickens and things like that. And my mom would select these uh, food uh, bags that had prints on them to make clothing out of for dresses for the girls and things like that. And she would select different styles and go back each week or every other week to buy those to make the clothing for some of the kids. So it was a tight life, but it was a great life that, that a lot of people don't get to share. We got to find out a lot about being in this world back then. And then one thing I remember vividly is uh, with all the kids in the household and everything else, my dad had another job working for General Tire and Rubber Company. My mom canned all fall long, worked hard, taking care of everything. But back then, no matter what she was doing, Bob, before my dad would arrive home from work, my mom would go back, clean up, put a little bit of makeup on, put a dress on or whatever, and look good to greet my dad at the door when he got home from work. And that kind of stuck in my mind as well, how things were way back then. Bob, I know with your history and business that you've hired a lot of people. Tell me about your theories of hiring people and how you go about that and what you look for. What I look for, Bob, in hiring people, of course, everyone wants to hire the very best people they can, but I look for filling filling voids that I have in my life. I'm not I'm not a um, a guy that likes to sit behind a computer and develop commercials, although we've done that. I'm not a guy that likes to take care of the technical side of all the stuff when it comes to computer knowledge and things like that. So what we've done, we've hired people that fill that void in my life to make our company a stronger company, and and to uh, that I say. I hired uh, Mike Durler, first of all, he came in as a volunteer with us and worked very hard as a volunteer every day. It was only gonna be a couple of days a week, but we got to be busier and busier and he ended up working every day as a volunteer. And then uh, finally we were able to get him on the payroll and he's still here today. He's now been with me six years. And then also on the uh, other side of it, when it comes to social media, we hired John Hurt back uh, last year and John Hurt's pretty savvy when it comes to social media and he keeps us current and keeps things flowing for us in the social media category. So when I hire people, I, I really look for people that are going to fill in that area that I don't know much about as all. 
at all. And I'm a firm believer that's the only way you're going to benefit the business and the community by hiring people that can fill the void and help you move forward. Therefore, the community also moves forward. We look at those kinds of people, engineering people. Rick Sold does my engineering for us. I don't do that. Every now and then I can do a little, but he takes care of that for me. So I look for people, Bob, to answer your question that um, are not negative thinkers. Uh, I like people that look at the positive side of life. They look at, uh, if you tell them there's a, oh, they're looking at a dead bird over there. They look up in the sky to see the bird fly. You know, I look at people that are going to be true to what I believe because I feel you accomplish a lot more in this world by being positive and not being negative. And some of the things that I've used in my life over that, and I've been here 43 years now, so a lot of people know me, but I get up in the morning pretty early. I get up around 2.30 every morning, come to work around 3.30, quarter to four. And before I get out of bed though, I, I pause just for a moment, but I get out of bed and I've done this for years and years. Some people get out of bed and crawl over to the window and look outside and say, good God, it's morning. Other people, and this is what I do, I get out of bed and walk over to the window and look out and say, good morning, God. By addressing my morning with that positive fashion and a good morning to God, it just sets the trend for the rest of my day. So I can carry that positive attitude, attitude through the rest of the day, not only for myself, but to people that work here for me and also the people that I associate with on a daily basis. Not as much the last three months though, but normally on a daily basis. And I think starting your day off with a positive attitude like that and then praying in the morning, I pray every morning, don't pray every night, but every morning start my morning off kneeling at the side of my bed with prayers. And um, I believe that's a very important part of keeping me straight and keeping me going for my family. Bob, in the past, we talked about a concept you shared with me about don't be a clock watcher. Yes, what, sir. What does that mean? That means that, you know, my days can be pretty long sometime. I know there comes a time in the afternoon, 4.35 o'clock, I have to wrap it up. But what I mean by that is if you're going to go to work and you work for somebody, you need to do the work at 8 o'clock in the morning. Don't get there at 8, 10, or 8, 15. Get there at a quarter to 8, 10 minutes to 8. Be, be before your starting time really starts and everything else. Because what sometimes we forget about, if an employer has six people coming in in the morning, they're supposed to be there at 8 o'clock in the morning, and they each run 10 minutes late. Well, in reality, he didn't lose 10 minutes. He lost 10 minutes times six in productivity from the employees. And that turns out to be an hour. And so that can be valuable time. And it's hard to make it up at the end of the day. Also, I mean, when it comes to your employees, don't be on them because they show up a few minutes late one day, the next day they may be earlier, things like that. Or if they take a little longer lunch break, we understand that. Be a little bit flexible for those employees. And then when it comes time for them to fight the bullet with your business, they're going to be flexible as well. And my people that I have around here that work with us are exactly that way. If it comes to working long days like last Saturday with the uh, reverse parade and everything in Alamogordo, Mike and John were right there up front saying, we got it, Bob. We're going to do this together. And, and I think, Bob, that's what I mean when I say, don't be a clock watcher. Bob, tell me about Operation Storm Cellar. I think that every business needs to be prepared for things like the COVID-19, although this caught the world off guard. But Operation Storm Cellar to me is, you have your basic plan for running your business day in and day out. The plan is based on a certain level of income coming in. Well, what happens when COVID-19 becomes a reality and business starts shutting down? The business that helped pay your bills starts shutting down. How are you gonna be able to handle that? How do you make adjustments in your budget to survive that downturn in the economy so you don't go out of business. The last thing I wanna do is go out of business. The last thing I wanna do is tell my employees, guys, it just ain't gonna work. COVID-19 ate our lunch. We're not going to make it. 
So when we saw this happening, I automatically started making uh, changes in the operation of the business. We've been able to save some dollars. I've been able to uh, uh, talk to my uh, bankers and, and make some changes in the structure of my loans, a couple of loans, to make it a little bit easier for me to make those monthly payments. So I had that pretty well planned out in my mind, what I would need to do. And, and we did that, Bob, and it seems to have worked out very well for us. You got to be ready for the days that become dark. Otherwise, you may not survive the situation. Bob, tell me about your concept of being a leader, um, um, no matter what happens, being a leader. You know, the, the most important part of my job, I think, is that it's not being on the radio in the morning, maybe not doing a, a remote broadcast, although they're important to me, but you got to lead the team. You, you can't be the negative force on the team. If you do, it's not going to work at all. You have to set the example when it comes to work ethic. You have to set the example when it comes to work hours. You have to set the example when it comes to taking care of your customers and working in the community. You need to lead the pack. You don't want to be the lone wolf. You want to lead the pack to lead them in the direction that you see the company going in. And hopefully they're on the same level with you to get you to where you're going. I mean, We've got with, with Mike and John here and, and Kendra and Rick and my son, Matt, helps us out a lot uh, more now than ever before. Although Matt started in radio when he was about six years old doing the school lunch menus. And he did that right here in Alamogordo and, and everything else. So we have the help of my son, Matt, right now. My daughter, Susan, although she lives in Las Cruces, Matt's up in Cloudcroft. She helps me out as well with some of the areas. But, but you want to have people with you, even family members, that understand the direction that you foresee the company going in in the future. Uh, we worked, Bob, on KTMN Radio. It was about a 14-year progress uh, process. Matt could tell you this. And I started working with my attorney in Washington back in, I think it was um, 2004, if I'm not mistaken, on that frequency. I did the research myself, then hired a consultant engineer to help me out. Well, I had to lead that. I wanted to not give up on that frequency because I knew it was going to be a big stick uh, broadcast station. We reached from the Pecos to the Rio Grande and beyond. So I wanted that license here in Alamogordo to help extend the mass coverage for the community of Alamogordo and Otero County within a larger region. So I punched up 97.9 in my car. I'd get in my car and the frequency was clear. There was no noise on it. I'd punch that up and, and tell myself, Flot, someday you're going to have that station on the air serving your Otero County community in Southern New Mexico. I had to do that, lead myself to that, and never lose faith to the fact that that was going to happen. And Bob, it finally happened 14 years later. And then one year ago, May 1st, we went to the new format on that, Rock 97.9 Classic Rock has been very good. So there are times when even though you don't feel good, you've got to come in and do the work, even though things may not be exactly right, maybe at home or with somebody else, you got to go forward, move forward to make sure you keep your eyes on that goal or it's going to disappear. So Bob, do you think that people that quit or that are not persistent have a, a lesser record of being successful? Oh, definitely. And I think I learned that early on, Bob, in my life uh, in radio sales. A lot of times, you know, you don't make the sale on the first call. You may not make the sale on the second call, third, fourth, or fifth call. But then after the ninth call, you might say, well, that person's never going to buy. So you give up on that person. And then what happens? Somebody else from another radio station goes to that business, knocks on the door, walks in. You've done the homework preparing them, preparing them to buy radio. And then they walk away the sale because you gave up on it. And I always say, never, never, never quit. Never give up. Because when you give up, you don't come out on top. Bob, why do you think it's important to always treat people with kindness? Because it'll come back to you, Bob. Uh, I've had several situations in my life where I've had things happen to me that I, I was not very 
comfortable with. I can I can share a couple of things with you that uh, uh, that that uh, it would be uh, neat to know about. I had a situation here uh, in Alamogordo uh, uh, several years ago uh, regarding uh, K Pasa Radio, and uh, something happened with that radio station uh, uh, via another person in this town, and. I didn't really like that person for a long time. And uh, it took me several months, maybe a year or so to overcome my distaste for that person. And one day I was at a uh, Rotary Club meeting and I saw that person in there and he was coming in as out of town visitor. And I walked up to him and I shook his hand and said, you know, what happened and happened in the past is the past. I said, I'm okay with that now. I'm moving forward, you have moved forward. Let's keep this thing going. And so I was able to, in my heart, forgive him for what may have happened, although it may have happened, it may have been part of my problem as well, but um, was able to look ahead and, and say, be positive, be a friend, and you'll get a friend in return. I cannot today hold grudges, Bob. I don't care if somebody cusses me out from one end to the other, I'm going to say, gee, thank you. You know, thanks. Now I know how you feel about me. So let's go on with this. I might even try to shake their hand or whatever. But um, I don't want to hold grudges. My God, by the way, won't allow me to hold grudges. He forbids that in my heart. And he knows that I don't want to do it. And he does not want me to do it either. Bob, on the list of things to talk about that you sent me, uh, number eight talks about staying married. You, you wrote on there. You brought this up in one of the first on the menus at the um, Roebeck Center uh, back when this first started. I think it was um, on the menu number one or one number two. You mentioned to the class there, Bob, that stay married. Remember that? I do. You remember that? Stay married. And you mentioned the fact because when you go through a divorce, you split the assets. And you mentioned it's this is a uh, uh, you, you know, a state where half goes one way, half goes the other way. And then if you get married again and you go through a divorce, you take those half of the assets you retained and split them again. Now you're down to a quarter of the assets. And your encouragement was to stay married, fight the battle if you need to fight the battle. That's what I'm saying. But stay married. Try every way you can to stay married because once you do go through a divorce, and my divorce was challenging back in 1994, and I've elected not to marry since then. Not that I'm afraid of splitting the assets again, but God hasn't presented me with an opportunity yet to, to remarry. So anybody that is looking at the possibility of a divorce in the future or whatever, think about it. Try every way you can to save that marriage. It's better for your family. It's better for your friends. And it's better for your life and your spouse's life as well. So I'm not a marriage counselor. I don't go there. Don't do that. But I went through a divorce I didn't want. So it happened. But you pick up from there and, and move yourself forward. Even though, Bob, the challenges were severe, were great. I had to re reorganize my whole life after that divorce. But we were able to do it and come to where we are today. But it's taken work to do that. Bob, often I hear a term about keeping up with the Jones. What's your theory on that? My theory is I went through that in my life. I went through that with uh, keeping up with the Joneses. I went through it when it came to living in houses, driving fancy cars like Cadillacs, having the uh, uh, three, four hundred dollar suits to wear to meetings. We don't wear many suits today. And um, when you try to keep up with the Joneses, what you're really doing is hurting your own self. If the Joneses build a new home and move into it, good for them. But if you have a nice home already and you're comfortable with it, why try to keep up with them? Why try to spend that money on keeping up with somebody else when you can be very, very comfortable with the current home you're in? And I learned that probably the hard way as well by doing some certain, certain things. But uh, Bob, I just, today I don't worry about it. I drive a 2001 Chevrolet Tahoe. It has about 100 and, uh, 
72,000 miles on it. It's in good condition. I take care of it. And I'm very happy with that car. It's almost 20 years old. It's a four wheel drive. I use it every day. I don't care if somebody pulls up with me in a brand new Mercedes. It doesn't bother me anymore. I'm happy where I am. I'm happy with my vehicle. I'm happy with where our businesses are going. Therefore, I'm not worrying about keeping up with anybody else. I'm gonna keep moving forward with what we're doing in our community. Bob, you told me that it's a good idea to be generous with your business and generous to the Lord. Can you expound on that a little bit? Well, every business person in town has numerous opportunities to contribute to uh, different organizations in his or her own community. It, it, it may be the Tiger basketball team, the football team, the Cloudcroft Bears, the Turosa Wildcats. It may be financial help they need. It may be something else as well. But I think it's very important to be generous in your community to the extent you can financially without hurting yourself or your business. And in our particular case, we do give some money, but most of our generosity is given to the community as public service announcements. And that totals up, I did an accounting for this for the National Association of Broadcasters a couple of years ago. They wanted to know what we contributed throughout the previous year in public service announcements. And we had to go recalculate that. And if I'm not mistaken, Bob, the number was at near $76,000 or something like that. That wasn't money out of my pocket, but it was free airtime on the radio stations. And that's what I can contribute in our community to make it a better place. So you need to do that to make your community better. And also don't forget the generosity of the Lord. The Lord has been very good to me. I've had stumbles in my life. He's looked down at me and said, okay, Bob, I'm gonna give you one more chance. Let's get it right this time. So I am a regular contributor to uh, my Lord. I attend Bethel Baptist Church and I do that on a regular monthly basis. I think it's very, very important to make contributions to your community any way you can. If it's service, go out and help clean up the yard, help do this or whatever, or contributing money or for your church to keep your church going. We need to support them as well financially. Bob, what role do you think integrity plays in business? Oh my goodness, good question. That is probably one of the more important roles for the long haul in business. If you have integrity in your business, if you have things that happen where you know, well, I could keep this or not keep it, what am I going to do? Um, you need to have that kind of integrity. And I've had some cases here now in McGordo where I was going through some changes and some money came in. The money at that time didn't rightly belong to me. So I called up the business owner and told him what was going on. And I said, I've got your check here. I'm not going to cash it, not going to deposit it, but I will give it back to you or you can come and get it. And I remember what he said, and he's still here in this community. He said, Bob, that tells me a lot about you. And, and, and so you need to have that in your life. I had another situation here just a couple of months ago where a business was advertising on a digital sign. They had paid for the advertising for six months. Then there was a mix up in communication. And my thought was they wanted to continue on it for the next month or so. Well, we continued with it, but then they called me up and say, Bob, I got a bill from you for, it was 250 bucks. And I'm trying to figure out what it was for. And I said, your digital market advertising on the, um, marquee over there and they said well I thought we canceled that and I said I, I don't recall that but I remember a conversation and they said we really meant to be off of that and not spend that $250 so Bob I hadn't cashed the check yet hadn't deposited yet that same day I took it over to them and gave it to them in their office and I think when you do things like that first of all you sleep better at night secondly you can look in the mirror in the morning and say I'm okay I didn't cheat anyone yesterday or any day out of everything. I think we must be able to support our word when we make a commitment. We must be able to address the situation when we're wrong and make it right. Otherwise, no matter how hard you try, it's just not going to be fun anymore. Bob, did you have any formal business training before you started your own business? Yes, I did. I, when I studied broadcasting, 
I studied broadcasting at Detroit School of Broadcasting back in, um, starting in 1963, um, actually back in 1960, or uh, shortly after high school. So that was an in-depth uh, instructions for me out of uh, Detroit, Michigan. And we learned a lot by going to that, but my best connection was I got to know a lot of disc jockeys back in the Detroit market, and they did a lot of record hops all around the area. And they would invite me to record hops around a downriver of Detroit area to come over to be a part of it with them. So I learned a lot about that side of it from then. And then I went to a lot of different schools on uh, uh, business management. It might've been through Dale Carnegie or some other source. I've gone to the seminars with See You at the Top, Zig Ziglar. I've done a lot of self-training on what would help improve what I'm doing in the communities I serve. And, and I think it's very, very important to continually train yourself to move forward. Uh, and I try to do that. I read a lot every day. I read about um, on the air in the morning. I read 45 minutes, one hour, 45 minutes, another hour. That's mostly local information, news and everything. But I do some other reading as well. I try to keep up on current events as much as I can. And I try to look at the latest things coming out in technology for our industry. But I also try to keep myself apprised of the changes in our industry. Like right now, what are we going to do if this COVID-19 carries on and keeps impacting the financial resources of all the businesses, including ours? So I, I want to be aware of what other broadcasters are doing so they can stay afloat as well. Sometimes, Bob, it gets to be a challenge. Sometimes, I haven't done this recently, thank God, but I've had my time where I've uh, woken up in the morning at two o'clock saying, oh my goodness, it's payroll day. I hope I have all the money there to make it and, and things like that. So I've had to self-train myself to be wiser in my management of money, to be wiser in my financial decisions. And I remember one thing that uh, God rest his soul, that Bob Hamilton told me one day when I had k Radio. He stopped by to talk to me one time. I don't know what he came in for, but we we're talking about finances and things like that. And he gave me some advice. I've never forgotten it. He said, Bob, take care of your pennies. Your dollars will fall in place. And I thought about that. Every penny has a value. 99 more of those pennies give you $1. And I remember that. And today I've been able to take care of those pennies and hopefully the dollars will continue to fall in place. I've learned that. And that was good advice from Bob Hamilton. Bob, tell me about a couple of people in your life at any time in your life that have inspired you and why. All right, I can um, go back to my uh, former partner, uh, Bill Sims. Uh, he was a very generous individual. And uh, Bill would uh, have uh, holiday parties for us for the Christmas time. And he'd give us uh, bonus checks with, with a card and everything. And he was always very generous with the amount of money he would give us. And then one year he uh, gave us our bonus checks at the party. And then later on, I was getting ready to leave with my family. We were going on a, um, uh, a cruise and also on a, uh, another trip outside of that. And Bill just caught me one day there in the office and said, Bob, this is for you. And I looked at it and it was round trip airline tickets for my whole family from Laramie, Wyoming, <clears throat> excuse me, it humbled me, from Laramie, Wyoming to uh, the Bahamas. Bahamas. And, and th that taught me back then that you need to be generous with people. Be easy on your employees, appreciate them. And I hope that my employees know that I do appreciate them. But I've never forgotten the fact that because I did a good job, at least he must have thought it was a good job, that he went beyond the normal to take care of me and my family. And Bob, that, that means a lot and it still carries in with me today because sometimes we forget to thank people for doing what they do for us. And I like to thank people for doing a good job. There's not always a pile of money available to give to them, but I found out in my life that a thank you goes a long way in showing appreciation and respect. 
Bob, at this point in your life, would you rather have more time or more money? I think right now it could be a little bit of a combination of both, but in reality, I, I need a little more time, I think. Uh, the days are pretty long. I'm trying to watch that right now. Um, the money will flow in as a seed and things like that, but I think the time is very important. I need the time to spend with, with my family. I need the time to spend with my 10 grandkids and the three great grandkids. I need the time to spend with my son, Matt, and his family, his wife, Molly, and uh, all of their kids. I need the time to spend with my daughter, Susan, her husband, Alex, and their kids. I need the time to take a trip to Laramie, Wyoming, and see some old friends of mine that I used to hunt with every year and associate with every year, socialize. And I need a little time to go ahead and do that. But time is so precious now, and it seems like since this pandemic has hit has, uh, hit us all, there's less time to do what we want to do because we're taking more time to keep things on track and try to move forward. So time to me is critical. I'm fortunate. I don't have to worry about being home at five o'clock at night for dinner. I go home when I want to go home and, and eat dinner. So that is a benefit. But Bob, right now, I would like a little more time in my life. Bob, do you think the answer to that question would have been the same when you were 30? No, not at all. No, at the, at the age of 30, I can tell you what, it was all about money. It was all about, like I said, driving the big car, having the fancy this, having the fancy that and everything else. We were more destined at that time in our life to provide our children with a great way of life and yet take those fantastic cruises and all those other things we did, which cost money to do. We worked in the time, but it cost money to do. So money was more important back then, but as we get older, as we get more gray hair, I think we see the need for less money personally. I don't live a highway of life, Bob. I'm pretty, um, pretty reasonable in the way I live. Uh, I want to pay my bills on time all the time. I want to have more time, I said, but the money today is not as important as it was when I was a younger man of 25 or 30, 35. Today, I need to spend more time with my family and definitely more time with my grandkids. Bob, I hear on the news a lot now about a concept called socialism. I'd like to know some of your thoughts about that since you've been in business for a long time. I, I think that socialism, Bob, is a very part of uh, uh, being in business. The, the people that we um, socialize with, what we do, where we go. Um, I'm very selective in my life right now. I have chances to do things with other people in the area that I elect not to do, you know, so that's on the side of that, being my social side of life. When it comes to a socialism way of government, and that's what you're talking about, right? Yes. I'll tell you what, the big thing that, that I'm afraid of with a socialistic society is we don't have our lives anymore. We don't have the freedom we have today uh, anymore. And a socialistic society deprives us of what we're used to as an American. And um, I fear for that. Sometimes I wonder if COVID-19 is going to be part of socialism. Sometimes I worry and think that our American society is moving more towards socialism than ever before. And I am strictly against it. I like the freedom of America. I like the freedom we have. I know right now that the COVID-19 has prevented us from having some of that just um, freedom but I do know that we're going to live through this as well. You know, I learned a long time ago, Bob, that the uh, uh, word American is spelled with the last four letters of being I can, I-C-A-N. That means I can survive what we're going through right now. That means I can survive the challenges that are ahead of us with this COVID-19. And that means that I can fight socialism if I elect to do so, and I'm gonna be a fighter and do so. Bob, looking back on your life, do you consider your life a success? 
and what do you want your legacy to be? I would consider my life to be uh, somewhat of a success. Um, I've had some ups and downs in my life, as you're aware of, well, you know, you're well aware of that, so is the community. I've had those ups and downs in my life, but I also learned when those downs are there, like I said before, never, never quit. Never take your eyes off the goal you have established for yourself, your family, or your company. And Bob, I went through a tremendous hardship there, uh, right around my divorce time and after my divorce and everything else, but I never lost faith in my God. I did not lose faith in myself, although there may have been a time or two that I'm going, oh, gee, am I doing the right thing, you know, or should I move on and do something else? I had a chance after my divorce and everything else in the stations, I had a chance to um, go to work um, on a kind of a consulting basis for a, a group of attorneys out of Phoenix, Arizona. They owned a group of stations up in Flagstaff. So they sent me to Flagstaff to look around their properties and give them some advice on what they should do to become local in the community. And I was able to do that for them. And they did offer me a job on one of my ending visits there but every time I'd go up there for a, for a few days during the week and come back on a weekend, I'd get back to Alamogordo and go, golly, this is my home. I love Alamogordo. I don't care what happened. That's in the past. The future is before me. And so I didn't go to work for that group of attorneys. I decided to make put in Alamogordo and started to work on developing more stations that particular time. And we've been able to do that today, but it's been a role to hold, to get to where we are. But I love it, Bob. Bob, knowing what you know now at this stage in your life, if you could turn the clock back, tell me a couple of things that you would have done differently or a do-over. A do-over, it would start with my family. I, I think when your children are young, you work hard to maybe supply them with the things you didn't have when you were a child. It may be when they get to drive a car, get the license at 16, get them a car. And, and I think when we're younger like that, we, we thrive to do the very best we can to make as much money as we can to give our family the lifestyle we want them to have. And that's what I think a lot of people do. I know I did it. What what was bad about that was I missed some things. I missed some ball games. I missed some concerts. I missed some school programs. I missed some things with my children that I regret today. We should have not missed those things, but I was so bound into giving them a better way of life that I really forgot about what was important to me as a father and my children first. I have great children, Bob, you know that, and, mm -hmm. and everything else. And um, I'm, I'm very fortunate. Matt and his family live up in Cloudcroft. Uh, after 25 years, he retired out of law enforcement, made out alive, and I thank the Lord for that. My daughter, Susan, and her husband, Alex, live in Las Cruces. So my family is close to me. They didn't have to move out to another state to continue their lives. But the big thing that, that I do regret today is Losing some of that time with the family. I want to let some of the people that are listening know that if you have a question for Bob, you can text it to me at 575-430-0548. Bob, if you were meeting with some young people, say they were 17 or 18, just graduating high school, Give me two or three things you would give them as far as general advice for life. General advice for life, I think, would be um, uh, something like um, discover the direction you want to go to, go with. And God made us all to do certain things in this world. I'm a firm believer of that. He made me out to be a radio guy. But, but get on track as to what you want to do in your life. Pray about it. Read about it. Research about it and things like that. And then once you make that decision, go for it. Go for it with your college education. Go for it with your commitment to the future. Go for it any way you can to get to where you want to go. 
And during that course of going forward, it's going to go in and out, up and down, and things like that. But never lose sight of what's out in front of you. Look at that goal map and say, I can get there. It's going to take me a while to do so, but I can make it. And Bob, I can relate to, you know, Rock 97.9 FM. I had several people of other broadcasts that knew that Bob, after 12, 13 years, it's a hopeless case for the FCC. And I did not feel that way. I felt that it's there. I've got to keep working towards it. And it finally did happen. So uh, the advice that I would say for somebody uh, embarking on a career, a new career, whatever, is outline it, know what you want to do, and go for it and don't quit. Live through those low spots as well as you live through the high spots. Learn from those low spots so you don't have to go back there anymore. Or maybe the curve will be a little less than what it was the last time. So dream big, dream often, and don't lose sight of that goal and do everything you can to reach that goal. In other words, never, never, never quit. Never give up. Bob, a few minutes ago, you were talking about your relationship with the bank, and especially when times are not going well. Tell me about the importance of having a good relationship with a banker and also maybe an attorney helping you with your business. And, and we, have, um, we have both of those things going right now. I think maybe one mistake I made earlier on in my life, Bob, I didn't keep uh, uh, my banker well enough informed on the industry, the broadcast industry. And, and then we went through that divorce and everything changed back then. But I think you have to have a top quality relationship with your banker. You must keep that banker informed on your business. If things are good, he can see that. If things are bad, he can see that. But he wants you to come in and sit down with him or her and share with them what's going on with your business, where you are today, how you got there, why you got there, and how you're going to dig yourself out of that trench and move forward. And I also found always have a banker in line to step in in case this other thing fails. Have somebody else pretty well groomed to understand your business, to know where you are, so they can pick up where the other bank left off. It's very important to plan on the fact because things are not forever, ever. Marriages aren't. Banker relationships aren't. Your banker may pass on. You may get, you know, have to groom a banker all over again. It's not really fun to groom a banker on your business. It takes a lot of time to do so. So I think that um, uh, working closely with your banker, telling them about your situations, good or bad, and also I believe in having another bank in the wing, so to speak, in case one relationship goes sour. Bob, tell me what you enjoy most about your life at this point. Being at the age I am today, what I enjoy about my life is, um, well, first of all, I enjoy getting up in the morning and working. I really enjoy that. I enjoy serving the community like I do. I enjoy doing parades, doing, you know, fair and rodeos and, and doing the Mescara Apache parade and things like that. I enjoy all of those kinds of things. And I think the, the true enjoyment is knowing the fact that um, we're serving the community in ways that other broadcasters have elected not to do here now, McGordo. We all do our own things. All broadcasters are excellent. Every group in town does its own thing its own way. And that is the benefit of the Otero County community. I like doing all the community things, which we picked up a long time ago and continue to do it. So we like that. I also like the fact that I can take a little time off if I want to, although it's cherished right now, but, but I can. If I wanted to go up to Matt and Molly's for a weekend and they invited me up there, I know I can trust Mike Durer and John Hurt to take care of everything for me. Like I said, Mike's been here six years. He knows the business in and out. He's been well-groomed here and he knows what to do. So I can leave and not worry about those things. Five years, four years ago when I got, um, when I went septic after the fair and rodeo and, and had a challenge in my life then, that took me out of the business for about um, a little over three months, which we thought was only going to be two or three days, but it was three months of recuperation. Well, 
Mike was my only team member back then, and Matt, my son, uh, but Mike stepped in, did the morning show every morning. He stepped in and did all the other things that I could not do because he knew what to do. So I think it's always good to have people with you that you can trust, even though they may be a volunteer, they still step up, take over and make sure the company moves forward. Bob, as we're wrapping things up for today, I, uh, I know that you are a, an excellent public speaker and that when you speak, whether it's uh, in person or on the radio, you do so with a tremendous amount of confidence. Tell me the role that confidence plays for you in success with your business and your personal life and how you got to be such a good speaker. Bob, I think it goes back to a lot of our training, but it also goes back to people helping you accomplish something along the way. When I was studying broadcasting in Detroit, part of our uh, training sessions were to go out in downtown Detroit and do a fake remote broadcast, like um, describe things that are going on doing a remote like you would if you were in real radio. So when my turn came up, there were 36 of us in that class. And when my turn came up to uh, do my description of what was going on in Detroit, I knew that radio had to paint the picture because you are the eyes of the listener. And I knew that the radio was kind of like a coloring book diagram. You fill in the color, you paint in the picture so your listeners can understand it. So I did this first remote in broadcast school in Detroit. And uh, I got the microphone, we recorded them all on tape recorders. I got the microphone and I talked about what I was seeing. I described everything and I can remember this. I can remember seeing a man walking the sidewalks of Detroit. His head was down, his hands were in his pockets. He was kind of humped over. And I described this person as a man that is deeply concerned about something in his life. There's something going on that's troubling him and he's thinking about it as he walks along, stumbles along the sidewalks of Detroit. And when I got done with that description and some other things, the uh, instructors in the broadcast school said, Flot, you've got it right on. That's what you do when you're broadcasting, remote broadcast and things like that. And then along the way, you have to have people encourage you. And then I've had a lot of people encourage me. And I got to tell you one person. And when we were opening up the Regency Retirement Community through the DARE board around 24 years ago now, well, R.B. Holmes was the banker, one of the bankers that we used back then. And R.B. Holmes, um, I believe was called Bob Norwest Bank back then. He let me open up an office in Norwest Bank so we could have a place to work out of and uh, get this project off the ground. And so I'm in my office working one day and this uh, gentleman came walking in. I didn't know very well, but he was a tall man. I'd call him high pockets. He was a tall man. He walked in and we shook hands and talked a little bit. And he said, Bob, when I heard that the DARE board hired you to get this project off the ground, I knew it was going to happen. And that was you, Bob Patillo, if you can remember that. And that gave me encouragement to say, you know, this is altogether different for me outside of radio. But Bob just told me I could do it. So I know I can do it. And Bob, it's those kinds of things in life, I really think, that carries us forward. You never know the impact it's going to have on an individual. It may be that day, that moment. It may be down the road a week. It may be down the road years, but you never know what's going to happen to you until somebody comes up and gives you that bit of encouragement. And that was one thing you did, Bob, which I remember today. You encouraged me by saying that to say, he's right. I can make this happen. And Bob, as you know, we were able to. Yep. And you did. Well, Bob, thank you for your your time today. I think we're so lucky in El Gordo to have you as part of this community. I will tell you today, I felt like a rookie reporter interviewing Larry King. <laughs> All right. Hey, Bob, don't forget, though, I've got your radio show lined up for you when you're ready. Okay. We'll All do right. that. All right. All right. Thanks well, thank a lot, you, Bob. Everyone. Thank yep. you, everybody, for watching, and uh, we'll see you soon. God thank bless. You.
Bye-bye.